uh, Vince, he uh, founded a game company called uh, Start, uh, Press Start Hong Kong. Um, they offer games to, um, to fulfill a company's desire to... <laughs> I'm not a public speaker, and Diana usually does this to me, so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here. But um, they, they help with um, corporate team building events. Uh, they also do private events, um, and more importantly, uh, educational games are what they do. And tying with our theme of today, uh, unlocking your inner genius. Uh, please welcome Vince, who is also in a band. He's a really cool guy. <laughs> please welcome Vince. Thank you. Ready, Mike? Everybody? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> morning. Hi, uh, I'm Vince. Thank you for coming out on a Friday morning. This is the earliest I've woken up all week, and I live in Wan Chai, so <laughs> thank you for the coffee as well. Um, so uh, thanks to George and the team for, for having me. Um, my name is Vince, and I press starts. Um, before I talk a little bit about what we do, which is obviously uh, corporate team building events um, and education stuff like that. Uh, just a brief introduction for those of you, which is probably not very about press support. Uh, this awesome girl, uh, Kate, is our space in Central. Uh, and what we do is we sort of do, we sort of try to explore the world through games. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about what games, what our definition of games is and, and why we focus on that in a second. Um, but we do a lot of consulting work as well um, with companies and also with schools. Um, and, and the schools part is, is what I'm you know, most passionate about. And this is also what I'll be sharing a little bit of examples about as well. Um, so when we talk about games, we actually talk about board games and analog games. So um, I mean, I, I know everybody here, you know, Pokemon Go and all the whole stuff, stuff happening. Um, a lot of the gamification stuff is happening on, on the computer, it's happening on the mobile and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm kind of an old school guy, um, so I only do board games and analog games, so anybody who doesn't like playing with cards and, and, and boards, you know, actually now is the time for you to, 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 uh, to get interested in. Um, why, why, I mean, why, why do I focus on, on board games? Um, first of all, how we started um, is, is my partner is my high school buddy. Uh, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to, you know, have had a time where, you know, we grew up with Scrabble, at, um, you know, at home. Um, even in high school, I went to boarding school in the states. Um, that was all sort of what we did. We did card games, board games. That was how we bought it together. Um, when we started this business, um, we went from that base and how board games and analog games can bring people together, as opposed to just sort of sitting behind a screen. So what we're seeing a lot these days and why parents, a lot, a lot of parents are a little bit concerned about the rise of video games because it's very easy to get isolated sitting behind a screen. It's very easy to sort of relegate to saying whatever you want, you know, trash talking people and not really have to deal with like the actual social consequences um, because you're very protected uh, behind the screen. So you can start, you know, yelling at people, start you know, dissing people, you know, do, saying whatever you want. Uh, but why we, we sort of want to do board games is because as probably most of you know, when you when you try to you know play Monopoly and you make someone bankrupt, there is a chance that they might flip the table and <laughs> never want to play with you again. And that is something that is quite important for everybody to sort of manage that, right? Um, obviously, it's all well and good if you dominate someone to the point that they never want to play with you again. But you also also lose a gaming buddy in the future, and that's like a real consequence that you have to deal with. Um, and this is why we, we want to focus on board games, especially because, um, if you guys didn't know, there is a board game renaissance going on, which is pretty awesome. Um, so if you haven't, you know, taken a look at the new games that are coming out, you're, you're really missing out. Um, I took this from from, uh, from another deck that, that you know we do all the time, which is to talk about uh, history development and um, the rise of, of games and, and sort of like the social um, underpinnings for that. I'm not going to go too deep in, into that, but why I wanted to highlight this is um, just, just to see 
that trend um, sort of popping up. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is that as people my age, 30s, 40s, start having kids, um, they're sort of going back to their old days um, and saying, hey, you know, we grew up with board games. We want to bring our kids into this culture. And this sort of, I think, can explain part of the rise. And also, because everybody is so um, digitized these days, um, you know, look at our phones, look at our screens all the time, um, it's always good to sort of unwind without um, having that sort of computer screen in front of us, especially on weekends after work and stuff. And what is quite interesting is everybody, you know, we hear all the time, how are kids going to uh, be focused on board games when they're, you know, everybody has ADD these days. Um, and, and, you know, I can't ever get my, my kid off my iPad. Um, I'm pleased to report that kids have better attention span, play the risk, than any other age group we've ever, you know, we've ever done events for. Um, and, you know, it was, this was just, I think, I think a month ago, we did a, a birthday party for 11 year olds. Uh, they came in not knowing anything about board games. They wanted to learn risk. And for the next three hours, no devices, nothing. They were so into risk. And the parents were on the side playing with their phones. <laughs> so, you know, just, just, just something to keep, uh, uh, keep, you know, keep thinking about. All right. So, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, today, you know, obviously talking a little bit more about education is the difference between educational games and games that educate. Uh, does anybody recognize this screenshot? Please. I don't know why. <laughs> anybody? Yes? I don't remember what it's called. Okay. I've sort of seen something like this before. This is called Math Blasters. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, yes. <laughs> All right, um, this is a game that I grew up playing at school. Uh, this was right around the time, I mean, you know, graphics, obviously, this is pretty old school. Um, this is right, right around the time when computers started getting popular in schools, uh, uh, you know, classrooms and stuff. It's very obvious what this game is trying to do. Uh, multiplication tables. Uh, the whole theme of, of the entire game is sort of space exploration. So when you you know, what as players you're trying to do is you try to move from planet to planet, you're trying to fend off aliens as, as you explore space, space and stuff. But you can't really progress through a level unless you get multiplication tables right. Um, so, you know, here I don't really remember the exact context, but it probably has something to do with like mixing potions and stuff like that. Uh, but that only works if you can answer what two times zero is. So, this is cool. Uh, this is fun. Obviously, it's a very colorful, uh, animated version of, of the game. Um, but I also wanted to highlight why we call this an educational game, because the education part comes first. And this is, you know, when, when schools and, and, and sort of different companies start talking about gamification these days, most of them sort of still talk about educational games in the, in the way we define it. Because at the core, it's really just a more colorful, animated version of homework. So when I used to be in classrooms, you know, the teacher would always say, hey, class is done for the day. Now it's time for Math Blasters, <laughs> which, which is sort of code for now it's time for homework, um, except the homework is done through an alien who is green, uh, which, was all, which was okay, you know, as, as, as a five-year-old, you know, this, this was all, you know, this was fun as well. Uh, but why I sort of wanted to highlight this um, is because teachers and, and parents especially are comfortable with that because there's always a, de uh, a definable goal at the end of this game. So at the end of an hour of game time, I can actually see whether or not George has mastered the multiplication table. And if not, hey, you can play another hour of math class, uh, which, is, which is a lot of fun, but still there's, an, there's, a, there's sort of like a KPI to that. <laughs> you know, in industry jargon. Um, Anybody recognize this game, please? Yeah. Yes. All right. SimCity. Sim SimCity. All right. This is one of my favorite games growing up. Um, SimCity 3000. Um, I have to name drop the 3000 because it's the best version of this game ever. Um, but, but I want to sort of uh, highlight the difference here. Educational games versus games that educate. Why we call this a game that educates um, is because it's a game first. Application, education comes second. Um, why? You know, most people when they talk about SimCity and, and sort of simulation games, um, they don't really focus on the educational part. 
because it's such a fun game. But I'm, I'm not able to build a very functional, and exciting, expandable city if I don't master like the little intricacies inside. Right? I need to manage my power plant. I need, to, I need to make sure each neighborhood has a police station. I need to make sure that the water, uh, the pipes, you know, everybody you know, gets, gets water and has sewage treatment and stuff. And if I don't master those concepts, my city will always you know, just stay in the middle, uh, you know, start having abandoned housing, and we really don't really know what's happening. Uh, there's also obviously the concept of tax dollars and stuff like that, which are pretty advanced concepts for you know, someone who's eight. Um, so, so when you start playing SimCity, you, you sort of go, what the hell is tax, right? Uh, what is a bond? But then I sort of realized that I need to take out a bond if I run into the red. So I just do that. But then what happens, you know, in, in two years' time, why am I even more in the red? Because, oh, actually, this is not free money. I have to pay back my bonds. Uh, so on and so forth. And, and, you know, you can make the same case for other sort of simulation games. Roller Coaster Tycoon, anybody? Yes. Anybody? All right. Awesome. Uh, yes. Um, you know, stuff like this, where, where um, this is fun. You're trying to satisfy your guests, satisfy your citizens. Um, but there's a lot of the, those business concepts um, that sort of tie in, and, and you have to master it before, before the game truly works for you. Um, so this is why we call this a uh, game that educates. And one thing that we're, we're very strong about um, uh, at Press Start is the theme. So obviously we do have other decks where we talk about how we you know, approach our game design and stuff like that. Um, again, I'm not going to go too in depth here. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk about gamification, um, they always talk about, oh, how do we motivate people um, you know, by different sort of game mechanisms? Do we award badges? Do we award points? Um, you know, do we, how do we sort of structure our levels? Um, you know, stuff like the Khan Academy, right? Um, you see like your, you know, your students' progress sort of like a chart, right? So the teacher sort of has like a little dashboard in terms of how the student is, is doing. The student sort of sees, oh, hey, I get a little badge for, <coughs> you know, X number of modules that I complete. You know, this is the same module um, as, as other writing sites. Um, anybody know Bleacher Report? Um, American Sports, I, I used to be a writer for Bleacher Report. And they, don't, they didn't really pay that much, actually, so, um, but they try to incentivize you with giving you medals. Um, so that was uh, that was quite interesting, you know. Uh, every thousand views, you get like uh, a bronze medal, and then you, you progress up until like a sapphire medal or something like that, like a platinum medal. So I, I think as writers, you're supposed to be motivated by having a platinum medal, um, not not by money. So that was more of the gamification thing that they tried to sort of infuse um, in terms of how they motivate you. Uh, but what we are sort of big at um, is is the theme. And we talk about the theme here, especially uh, SimCity theme is around city building. Um, something that's closer to home. Monopoly <coughs> is about um, sort of real estate, mortgage piece. Actually, interesting fact. Um, did anybody know that Monopoly was originally designed um, during the Great Depression? And the first iteration of the game is called the Landlord's Game. And what Lizzie McGee who was a uh, pioneering female game designer back in the day, um, wanted to do was to showcase the sort of big difference between uh, landlords and tenants during the era of the Great Depression. So that's why the winning condition in that game is not, not just for the winning player to, uh, to own as much money as possible, but for everybody else to be bankrupt. Um, because it, it, it ties in with the theme of the Great Depression and um, it ties in with what she originally wanted to show um, as, as the sort of cutthroat nature of, of the sort of mortgage real estate market. So next time, when you're playing Monopoly with your kids or friends, um, and you're trying to bankrupt everybody, um, you know, it's interesting how that sort of evolved into a family-friendly game. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that was the original theme. Anyway, uh, we have SCAD here today, um, so this is fun. Uh, we just uh, worked with SCAD last November. Um, so, curiously and coincidentally, they have a uh, program in game design, and in November, you know, uh, last semester, they also had a module in principles of board game design, 
which is like the most niche program that any school in Hong Kong can ever come up with, uh, which happens to match with the most niche company that Hong Kong can ever come up with. Um, um, so, so we went in and, and we sort of assigned their, their term project. Uh, and this was them at, at our space uh, back in November, sort of demoing the game that um, they designed based on our brief. And, and why I sort of wanted to highlight this is because obviously games you know, they work well, and George also mentioned this at the beginning, uh, as vehicles for, for team building and, and sort of um, ice breaking, obviously, but also communication strategies and things like that. Um, that is a nice business model for us to have, keeps our business running, but this stuff, uh, the school stuff, is, is what really gets my gets me up in the morning. Um, and, that, and, and the whole concept of sort of unlocking, you know, call it genius, call it creativity, um, call it um, the hidden side of what kids and students have inside them that they can't really show otherwise. Um, that's what's really cool. So, so I just, want, just wanted to sort of tell, tell a few stories, uh, give a little, you know, a few examples of how, you know, what we do, how we do it, um, and also <coughs> why it's really exciting. And, and I think, um, especially with all, all you know, designers, actually, I, I, I come from a background of design consulting, so I don't, I don't really draw anything. Um, so not, not as much on the UX uh, side, but a lot of how design helps um, in business, design helps uh, with companies. A lot of that is actually pretty transferable when we talk about games and how we infuse um, these sort of uh, game design concepts in, into what we do. So the first thing here um, is obviously we do do our, our own custom game design. Uh, we're in the process of publishing our own game with, with PolyU. Um, that's coming up over the next uh, couple months. Um, so after that, we're going to go for a wider market release. So do keep an eye out on Kickstarter um, because we're going to have a game on again another niche topic, uh, fashion buying. Uh, that's coming up. It's a fun game, I promise you. <laughs> Just the theme is a little bit niche as well. Uh, this is a game called King of Hong Kong, and we base this off of a existing game, game called King of Tokyo. Uh, see the obvious parallels there. Uh, what we what we did is is. Uh, we, we sort of modified and localized this to, to a Hong Kong context, and we designed a whole educational workshop out of it. Um, the, the, the premise of the game is everybody is sort of like a Godzilla-type monster, um, and you, know, you score points in the base game uh, attacking Tokyo, um, getting as many damage points as possible, trying to beat up the other monsters, um, stuff like that. What we did was obviously we modified the board to say Hong Kong Island and Kowloon, uh, but we also added different elements to it, um, which is you know something called the landmark card. I'm not going to go into detail of how the game is played, but why we added the landmark card is, and you can see that in the map over here, is whenever a monster enters Hong Kong Island or, or Kowloon, um, an extra action that they have to do is to draw a landmark from this landmark card. So, and, and this workshop is geared towards eight to twelve year olds. Um, so, so, so what they do is. Uh, you know, I enter Hong Kong Island, my, you know, my monster's name is Godzilla, and then I sort of pick out landmark, and oh, I get IFC. Well, you know, somebody might not know where IFC is, or Standard Market, or Tai O, or any place else. Um, and then what happens is, as we are going through Hong Kong attacking, we're also mapping real-time trail destruction of the monsters that you know, we've created. Um, so obviously the first assignment, um, again, this is a creative sort of writing workshop, creative journalism. Uh, the first assignment is for the kids to design their own monsters. They write their own bio, so they have to really get into the persona of their monster. Um, I'm from Mars, I'm from Jupiter, whatever. Why am I attacking Hong Kong? And now, as I'm attacking Hong Kong, you see the trail of destruction of each monster. So this is sort of happening, sort of like a crime scene investigation, sort of like a real-time development of where these monsters are happening. So in the middle, we sort of, we sort of take a break, and there's like a little role-playing exercise. Um, fictional journalism where every kid in the workshop sort of takes on a different role. Um, someone might be a concerned citizen, someone might be a monster expert, someone might be, you know, the head of the Hong Kong police force or something. Um, and, and everybody starts interviewing each other. And obviously you see the newspaper here. That's the sort of KPI, the deliverable, that we still have to bake in. Um, but this is what uh, the kids sort of take away. And what's really interesting is, uh, so, so we designed this with, with uh, one of our uh, partners who does a sort of writing center. And what's really interesting is um, a, break, a break outside of the writing 101. How do you write a detective story? How do you write a news story? 
um, sort of format. The kids never want to leave. This, this workshop um, is across three days, two and a half hours each day, and it's almost every day they almost uh, overrun to at least three hours. At the end of the class, um, everybody you know, is super excited. Where can we buy this game? Unfortunately, it's limited edition. <laughs> um, where can we buy this game? Can we continue playing it at home and stuff like that? So this is really exciting because um, you get to see, um, like e even, you know, this is, this is from our first workshop back in December. Uh, just from how the kids sort of design the monsters, design the origin stories, really tells you a lot about themselves as well. Um, skipping ahead to this, this is, um, we did this with the Harvard School um, this spring. Um, design your own board game workshop. Um, so obviously we start, with, we start with a base game called Camel Up, which is a camel racing game. But what we try to do is, after we teach them how to play this game, um, again, we talk about the theme. So they design their own theme, they design their own characters, the backstory, why are the camels racing, or why the fish racing, so on and so forth. So they have to apply those, game, uh, those themes and those stories um, onto the base game. And again, this is for grade uh, three to six. So, you know, very, very young age, uh, and you see all these kids are, are really actually getting down to business. Um, we're sort of taking them on a journey of sort of prototyping um, a game, doing their own game design and stuff like that. So this here, you see like working with cardboard and actually drawing out their own little, uh, little game boards and stuff. Um, then we also had like a little session with, uh, with the 3D printing partner where they got to design their own dice. Um, what is interesting is when you have sort of third to sixth graders designing their own dice, um, we adults usually think of dice as one, two, three, four, five, six. But we saw kids who designed dice with negative one, um, with a star, and with a question mark. And so obviously we don't want to just sort of stop at that point, right? Because they're designing their own rules and designing their own theme. So we have to start challenging them, hey, what happens when you roll a question mark? So they have to then write down a specific rule uh, for the whole game, what happens when you roll a question mark? What happens if you roll a negative one and you actually, your first roll is a negative one, so you have to you know, leave the board because you start with zero, right? <laughs> so all these things, it's sort of like, we're not just prompting them to just do whatever, but these things have consequences and you have to explain to us what these consequences are and how your friends, when they're playing them, how, how do they understand and how are they on the same way? Like, how do you explain to them what happens in the context of this game? Um, and so all of this happens, you know, we use existing game pieces to, to complete the mock-up, but there's also that very important element of, of play testing, where everybody has to sit together. Um, and obviously these kids with ADD, they, they sit together and they say, ah, I want to play this game, oh, what is it about? And they start sort of getting distracted, but then once the, kid, the game designer kid is explaining the rules, going through what happens when you roll each dice and how much money everybody starts off with. Everybody starts getting really into it. And when we do the sort of post play testing debrief, everybody actually brings a lot to the table. And then uh, we sort of do like uh, like a little pitch session in front of the class where each kid gets up to the, uh, get, gets up in the, you know uh, in front of the room and presents. Hey, my game is about uh, shrimp. This is an actual game that they designed. Shrimp racing um, in the middle of the ocean trying to escape from a shark. Um, now, I have no idea why sharks are hunting shrimp, um, but apparently they are. And so then you know, when you start asking the questions, and you know, I don't have to ask them these questions because all the other kids are just like, why are sharks hunting the shrimp? You know, and then, and then the kid sort of says, uh, says uh, each shrimp starts out with 100 bucks. <laughs> And then, and, then, and then the designer kid has to answer questions like, why do the shrimp need money? Um, you know, stuff like that, and which, which is just mind-boggling. There's, there's, another, there's another really cool one, um, which was just crazy. Um, it was multiple instances of Nicolas Cage uh, across, across alternate universes. Um, and the one Nicolas Cage that crossed the finish line first would become the real Nicolas Cage <laughs> uh, to act in a movie in Hollywood. So it's like, and I, have no, I, have, I have no idea why or how, but you know, but, but credit, to the, credit to the kid, when, when, when we were at the sort of 3D printing lab, he actually drew out Nicolas Cage, uh, his head, and he printed out like five color versions, 
of the Eclipse cage. <laughs> so when we when we did the when we did the uh, the prototype, you know, each player was actually moving a blue Nicolas Cage head and a red Nicolas Cage head, and they started talking about like Nicolas Cage movies, um, and I'm just gonna stop there. Like, <laughs> anyway, so so you know, unlocking genius, um, especially when when genius takes the form of Nicolas Cage. <laughs> All right, um, just just a couple more examples. Um, this is this is something that um, is, is very interesting to us because um, you saw previously we did a lot of um, work with, with students and, and kids. Um, what this is is um, obviously this is with adults, um, but this is with teachers. And one thing that's very interesting um, for, for those of you who might be familiar with the Hawkeye education system, it's, re it's very based on rote learning and memorization, big classes. For I used to go through that system, so I know it very well. And what they're trying to, you know, what they're coming around to is the concept of getting kids engaged in class. How do you bring them up to speed? How do you get them interested in what you're talking about, as opposed to just delivering lectures um, and just giving them tests and stuff? So we've done, actually, we're starting to do a lot of teacher training these days. Uh, this is with a program uh, that's sponsored by the Jockey Club. Um, this is the first ever teacher fellowship program in Hong Kong that lasts more than 10 days. Um, so obviously there's a lot of sabbaticals in, in the States, in, uh, you know, um, and in Europe and stuff like that where teachers can't take off a semester to, do, to pursue projects and pursue topics that they like. In Hong Kong, previously, uh, the longest time to take off from school was 10 days. And so, you know, you go to a trip to Japan, you're done with five days, and you sleep for the you know, the remaining five days and you actually get back to school. Um, what the Jockey Club is doing, which is really interesting, is they're funding um, not the teachers, well, obviously the teachers, um, to, to sort of do their studies, but also funding the schools um, to find substitute teachers for 10 weeks so that the principals are comfortable releasing those teachers for them to do um, exciting projects. So they get to go to sort of study trips overseas to Finland. Uh, to study sort of like more innovative uh, schools of, of learning, of teaching. Some of them went to Holland, some of them went to um, Australia, stuff like that. Um, anyway, long story short, this, this, this is what we did uh, for that fellowship program, and, and we've since done uh, a couple more for organizations like Teach for Hong Kong, um, and stuff like that, where um, obviously we do talk a little bit about um, sort of like how we do game design, and how we do program design, and how that sort of fits in with the overall sort of curriculum design, how you deliver um, subjects to students. Um, this, these, these, two, these two pictures here, um, this is a game called Hanabi, one of, one of my favorite games. Um, it's, it's a cooperative game. I don't know if anybody has played a cooperative game before, uh, where everybody is actually on the same team, aiming for the same goal, and so you actually learn a lot about uh, everybody's communication uh, styles, and stuff like that. So this was sort of like a really great way to sort of bring everybody together. And then uh, we did a little demo of what games there are from a theme, from a thematic perspective that can tie in um, with, with subjects. So this is one of the games that we highlighted and I'm gonna end with this slide. This is a game called Seven Wonders. Um, it's a game obviously played up to seven players. Um, and what's interesting here is you can see each of the ancient seven wonders has a uh, game, has, has sort of like a player board. Um, and the way the board is structured, you can see here, different elements, uh, sort of different inherent elements of each board. And there are sort of different uh, criteria uh, for building out the wonder. Their objective is obviously to get, uh, not just to complete building the wonder, but to get the most victory points. And how you score victory points is across different uh, themes. So you can score through military, you can score through scientific research, um, through trade and money and stuff like that. But um, what's interesting is each board actually has a customized winning strategy based on the actual uh, historical context of that wonder. For example, uh, the Pyramids of Giza. This was, you know, by and large, just sort of like a vanity project by the pharaohs of the time. So how do you actually um, score points and how you build up your Pyramid of Giza is to build up your sort of esteem points. Um, it's 
a lot of it is about money. The cost of roads was a show of military might um, at you know sort of like at the uh, at the entrance of the ports. So that board lent itself to the military strategy. So if you are strong um, in terms of building up your army and you sort of defeat your neighbors in terms of uh, military strength, that's how you build that one. Hangar is a bad one. Um, you score points based on scientific research. So all this actually sort of fits in with the theme itself. And there are obviously cards here. There are um, other cards um, that you use to sort of build up your inventory and build up your elements and stuff. And those are all sort of the different buildings um, that you would see during those times. So you would have like granaries, you have barracks, uh, your aqueducts that would do different things for you. They would combo if you had an aqueduct or you had a granary that upgrade to a warehouse and that's a free upgrade and you get more stuff, you know, so on and so forth. So this is something that we're working with a lot of schools now to, to sort of um, to sort of infuse with uh, into their syllabus. And our starting point and what the teachers are really interested in is when you're talking about ancient history or medieval history um, and stuff like that, uh, besides, you know, instead of having a teacher tell you about, hey, these are the pyramids of Giza, um, this is the statue of Zeus or the temple of Zeus, uh, so on and so forth. You know, it would be a lot more interesting to have the kids just play through this first, do their own research, what are these buildings about, what are these sort of uh, monuments about, and then create their own version of this game. So this is sort of like the projects that we're sort of trying to inspire teachers to do, trying to inspire school principals to do, um, and stuff like that. So, uh, and this is the way to get, uh, in, our, in our opinion, to get those kids who are not as academically like book smart to still get them interested because we're attracting them with the theme. So that's well that that's pretty much it for, for um, what I was going to talk to to everybody about today. Um, but just to leave you guys with, with this sort of more impressive um, visual um, depiction of the game. So thank you very much. So um, my favorite game is actually this game, Anabi. Uh, this is also the game that we use in workshops a lot. Um, and I like it because it's, it's, it's a cooperative game and because you can learn a lot about people um, while, you're, while you're sort of playing it. So what we do, so maybe a little bit of more of an elaboration here. Um, when, when we talk about like sort of communication, you know, there are a lot of people who you know, do corporate training and they say, hey, you are an INTJ or you are this persona type and this is how you communicate with them. But here, um, you know, for those contexts, you're sort of putting people in brackets. It's like, oh, you're an INTJ, this is how I'm gonna communicate with you. But when we, when we put people, uh, we put uh, players in this context, you actually know how exactly they're going to behave when they react to your personal clues. So what happened? So how this game works is, um, so it's sort of like played like, kind of like Uno, um, but in Uno, you have the, the number side facing yourself. In this game, you have it facing outwards. So everybody on your team knows what you have, except for you yourself. So you're trying to give clues um, to your teammates, saying, trying to tell them what you have, um, but at the same time, you're trying to complete like the numbered sequence across different suits. Um, and there are a finite number of clues, finite number of cards, so within that finite amount of time, you're trying to complete a full score. So this is how, like, if you can, you know, find out immediately if someone's a conservative player and how do you sort of tailor your clue giving to that person, knowing that he or she has to have complete information before they take a move. And somebody, you know, once you say something to them, they might interpret it you know, in a very aggressive manner. Okay, you telling me this because I need to play it. So then they do that right away. So there's a lot of very personalized learning there. Um, I've taught this game and I've played this game, you know, upwards of a hundred times. Um, and every single time, um, I still get fascinated just sort of seeing how people sort of adapt to each other on the fly. And I've never seen this game played only once. Um, everybody that we've done this game with, either in a social context or in a workshop context, uh, context. Um, after they've played through the first round, everybody 
says, let's play another round. And so I think that's a testament to how awful this game is. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> What's the name of the game? Hanabi. Yeah. Hanabi. H-A-N-A-B-I. So it's the Japanese term for fireworks, but it was designed by an American designer. So. <laughs> but is it good, more good for adults? No, we, we've done it with uh, kids as well. Yeah, uh, because I have two, yeah. seven years old kids, uh -huh. and then um, the boy is uh, <coughs> kind of cannot be concentrating in the same thing for more sure. than 50 minutes. 15 minutes. And then in my home, I don't have TV, uh -huh. I don't have iPad, okay. they're not using mobile <laughs> because they're not permitted to do it. Okay, but, that's good. You know, <laughs> and board game, yeah. actually I, I heard of that before. Yeah. I really, I, I did have a, a motive to, to, want to want them to play it. Mm -hmm. So, if they talk about seven so and then they go into army two in school, yeah. what game you would suggest they can start first? So I think this game is probably a little too complicated uh, yeah. for seven year olds. Yeah. Um, but there are actually so um, obviously the, the game that I talked about here, the base game, uh, King of Tokyo, that's that's a good one. There, uh, there's a lot of very interesting uh, thematically engaging games. So there, we have a game called Sushi Go. Sushi. Yes, um, and that's super. That's super popular. It's sort of like eating at Genki Sushi, like a conveyor belt sushi restaurant. Um, obviously, it doesn't involve real sushi, uh, but paper versions. But paper versions of sushi. So that game is sort of like it's, it's very cartoony. Actually, adults like playing that game as well. Um, and it, this is one of our most uh, sort of popular uh, family games because it's very easy to explain. You know, the whole concept of so. Everybody sort of like passes their cards because it's sort of like a conveyor belt sushi. It sort of goes around the table, um, and you score points. Like if you have three sashimi cards, you get ten points. Um, you know stuff like that. That like it, it's it's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean we, I I could give you a list of games uh, very easily. There's, mm -hmm. there's plenty of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Because I think that kind of board game, and then uh, be, my boy can be very concentrated. Yeah. On that. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The song is a, is a new one, and then it's um, funny. Yeah. Last dude. week, last week we did um, we, we ran a board game corner at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, Ooh. As they opened their auditorium for Bring Your Kids to Work Day. Wow. Um, so like we had like a hundred people sort of coming through, um, families who worked at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, bringing their kids just to try out the games. So it works. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Just a simple one, huh? that graph you had from other yeah. songs that were before me. Yeah. What you, what's, what's writing that group? Um, I don't have a complete answer for you, uh, but this this game, I don't know if anybody has heard of it, uh, Settlers of Catan. Um, this was sort of the game that sort of drove the Renaissance. This was <coughs> excuse me, designed by a German designer in the mid 90s. And previously, everybody sort of thought about games as monopoly and, and risk and sort of outdated stuff. And you know, we can see sort of this time when there was like a little plateau. Um, this was sort of, this coincides with the period when everybody started thinking about console games and video games. Everybody wanted to go to the arcade and, and play sort of you know the hit games at the time. And everybody started having PlayStation and stuff at home. <clears throat> so that was the novelty thing. But when Catan came out, um, that was sort of the one sort of trigger point where everybody was like, oh, board games are still cool. <coughs> um, and so that, like, you know, everybody sort of in the industry also talks, sort of sees that as like a little turning point. Um, and what's ironic about, you know, the, the rise of the internet as well, is it's given a lot of people um, access to games. Um, so actually board and card games are the highest funded category on Kickstarter. Uh, the most funded game of all time on Kickstarter is a uh, really stupid card game called Exploding Kittens. Um, <laughs> if anybody has heard of the Oatmeal, um, the webcomic, it's designed by the Saints, uh, by, by the creators of the Oatmeal. Um, they raised, I believe, 8 million US on Kickstarter. Um, it's not the most funded uh, in terms of um, monetary value, but it's the most number of funders um, in Kickstarter history. So this kind of stuff, you know, when you have you know hobby designers who just hoping to get a game released, uh, but they do like really wacky themes and stuff like that. 
um, it's really easy. You know, even if you get like a thousand backers, you can get your game done, um, and so on and so forth. That's sort of, uh, and also obviously overseas shipping, Amazon and stuff like that. Um, we get all our games through Amazon stuff, so that's really driven like the sort of popularity of uh, like, search again games. And I guess kind of a follow-up question. That I, I, I'm totally with this, right? Yeah. And, like, this is actually really reoccurring here in the, uh, yeah. in the overly digital world we live in. Yeah. But I guess, do you always see that these spaces will remain really separate? Or essentially digital games and analog games? Or do you see that there's like, there is an opportunity for an overlap? So that's very interesting because right now, uh, there is even more overlap. So right now, uh, the next trend in board games is um, sort of cross-platform games. So we, we are seeing a lot of games now that start to use phone apps as like the game masters. So instead of having like um, sort of players like write out like the little algorithms and sort of scoring and stuff, um, you have phone apps that can sort of scan um, <coughs> like the board, scan the, the cards that players have and do the scoring for you. Um, there's a game we have called Alchemists, um, which is super interesting. Um, it's about alchemy, obviously, um, and sort of combining different, potion, uh, different elements to create potions. Uh, what's cool about that game is every, so, so there's a lot of deduction in that game. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to combine two cards, you're trying to figure out whether or not this element is what you think it is, and you're trying to publish theories. Um, but the crux of that game is um, underlying that game, uh, the configuration is always different. So if you were to do it manually, it would be a very complex thing, try, just trying to map out different uh, combinations. They have an app for that. Um, so that sort of helps with, like, if you're about to publish a theory or you're about to challenge someone's publishing, you can use the app just to sort of uh, just sort of verify that, and it does all that for you. Um, there's a game called XCOM, um, which is one of the uh, defining games that make use of like multi-platform, omni-channel uh, board gaming. <clears throat> so so that, that's what's happening. Um, and so from, from a game design uh, perspective, uh, a lot of the sort of principles within board games are transferable to, to video game design. Because if you think about it, it's, <clears throat> at the core it's still like the same sort of mechanisms, it's still the same concepts, it's just in a video game you're more immersed from a graphical standpoint. Um, how you play it, for example, if, if you look at RPGs like uh, Dragon Age, for example, or Final Fantasy, <coughs> uh, all of the combat systems are based on the Dungeons and Dragons D20 system. So when you do attack, when you do damage to opponents uh, on Final Fantasy, uh, on the back end, the computer is rolling a dice for you. And that's how every time you do, uh, every time you do an attack, you might get minus 20, you might get minus 10, it's all based on those dice rolls. So it's how you just sort of layer uh, that skin on top. Um, and final example is one of the key designers in Civilization VI actually comes from board game design. Questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey, what a creative take on these things. Which way we go? Yeah, thank you guys for uh, coming today. Um, we've got a very special event in two months' time, which is Audience Takes the Stage. Um, so instead of getting professionals like Vince to come and talk, we're going to ask. Some of the audience members, uh, if they want to take part, they can they can submit their applications. They take maybe three or four uh, speeches in October, um, which coincides with Juliet, who started Creative Mornings in Hong Kong. Uh, she's going back to Hong Kong at the same time as well. So it should be a very interesting event in October. So if you're interested in, in taking part, please submit your application to us, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll see you then. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, guys, and thanks a lot, Vince. Thanks. Thank you.